We're going to move on to strategic goal B, target five. By 2020, the rate of loss of all natural habitats, including forests, is at least halved and, where feasible, brought close to zero. And degradation and fragmentation is significantly reduced. Before I introduce our new speaker, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm sorry. My name is Nadine Saad. I'm a program officer with the Secretariat of the CBD. Um, so our next speaker is an old colleague of ours and still is very closely related. It's Tim Christofferson. He is a forest engineer and is coordinator of the U UNEP RED program. He previously worked on issues of forest biodiversity for the UN Environment Program at the Secretariat of the CBD. Thank you very much and good morning. My name is Tim Christophers and I'm uh, working for the United Nations Environment Program and I'm here to talk to you about a very bold commitment that 192 countries and the European Union have made in 2010 to halve the rate of loss of natural ecosystems. The ecosystem I want to focus on are forests. Not only because forests are very important for biodiversity, they harbor about two-thirds of all species, they have immense importance uh, for other values, but also because forests are very close to my heart. My grandfather was a forester, and uh, many of my fondest childhood memories are related to forests and the way that forests shelter and provide. So I'm very happy that I can work on trying to save forests. And um, to show you the magnitude of the problem, this is the start of France in Paris which just in preparation for this talk, we planted a large tropical forest in there. But if you now look in the next three seconds, this is how long it takes to deforest one hectare. So this happens every second of every hour, every day, every year. The total of that deforestation is 13 million hectares, about the size of Greece or Nicaragua. And, thank you. Why is that problematic? Not only because forests provide pollination services for agriculture, they provide lots of non-timber forest products for nutrition, livelihoods, they provide timber, a great renewable resource, wonderful to build with, they provide bioenergy, water, pharmaceuticals. For example, estimated that 50% of all the medicinal drugs in the Western world come from tropical ecosystems. So those are all important reasons. There's one important reason that has been much discussed recently in addition to those, and that's climate change. Since 1958, we have very exact measurements from the Mauna Loa volcano on Hawaii about the carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere. And you all know this curve, it goes up and has by far uh, gone above pre-industrial levels. But what I would like you to focus on here is that every year this graph also goes up and down. And that is because every year in winter of the Northern Hemisphere, the large forests of Siberia, Canada, Alaska, they shut down for six months. And when they spring back to life, this is how much carbon dioxide they absorb, just by starting photosynthesis again. Forests contain more carbon than the entire atmosphere. So they're an important carbon sink. They're very important for regulating Climate. But beyond all these reasons why forests are important for our survival, there's a more profound reason, and that is that forests are also home to our closest living relatives, to the great apes, to orangutans, chimpanzees, gorillas, with whom we share more than 98% of our DNA. Forests are also a place of cultural and spiritual worship and identity. These uh, baobab trees, 
are referred to across Africa as an example of the wrath of the gods. They, because the baobab trees angered the gods, they threw them down top first to earth. And <laughs> the story goes that now these trees have to grow the air and they're crowned in the ground. <laughs> Another important aspect why we need to save forests is that forests are intricately, inter, 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 sorry, intricately linked uh, systems where every piece of the system depends on another. This is a type of uh, liana that is sprouting here from elephant dung. So this seed of the tree has been eaten by an elephant and is thus dispersed and this particular plant can only germinate after it has gone through the stomach of an elephant or another large mammal. And about 70% of all the trees in the tropics depend on mammals for their seed dispersal. So we also have to see forests as an ecosystem, it's not just trees, it's a functional ecosystem where every piece and every species plays an important role. So what can we do about deforestation and forest degradation? There is an approach that is still in its infancy but that holds a lot of promise called RED+. Plus. It's been agreed five years ago in the climate convention that potentially developing countries could be paid for leaving their forests standing and for improving forest quality and for even enhancing forest carbon stocks, so planting new forests and improving the quality of forests. And we're now working with uh, over 40 countries worldwide to implement these uh, measures and we have very promising success stories and I'll mention three countries in particular in, in a minute. And I think I could spend a lot of time focusing on the negative aspects of deforestation and on how catastrophic the forest loss is. But I want to focus on the positive aspects and what is happening now that gives us some hope. One example that is already several decades old but that is quite promising for all developing countries is Costa Rica. Costa Rica went through a phase of severe deforestation until 1987, down to 21% forest cover. And then a number of policies were implemented that could incentivize, that could pay landholders for saving their forests and increasing forest cover. And Costa Rica managed to then come back up to 51% forest cover through these measures, and that triggered a whole range of ecosystem services that contributed to the livelihoods of local communities. Another positive aspect, and here we can separate now the pessimists from the optimists in the room, is this curve here. If you look at the deforestation rate since 1800 and until 2010, and you look at the same time at the population growth, you could say it's true what's been said that forests precede civilizations and deserts follow them, if you're a pessimist. But if you think that the glass is half full rather than half empty, you'll focus on this part here in the curve, where we managed to decouple deforestation from population growth. And that's an important factor here. If we hope to reach Aichi Target 5 to at least half the rate of deforestation by 2020, we have to become more efficient. We just heard about smallholder agriculture, how to improve the production of food, production of energy. This is the point where we separated building our growth on the depletion of natural capital. We have to further work on this, become more efficient, be able to produce more food, more energy on the same amount of land and conserve the remaining forests. You'll also notice here that the trend of acceleration of the deforestation has at least slowed down. We, of course, need to bring this curve downwards before 2020. That is the big challenge. Now, how can we do that and how will we do that? Some positive developments. We are working 
with the World Resources Institute on a new tool called Global Forest Watch 2.0 that will show us in almost real time, every 16 days, images of deforestation as it occurs. This is an image from South Central Borneo. And with that, with those deforestation alerts, we can then go to the governments, go to the stakeholders, and see what is behind that deforestation. This tool will also enable us to say if that deforestation happens in a logging concession, so is it just a regular temporary removal of trees, or does it happen in a protected area? And with that information, which um, is powered by Google Earth and will be widely available, we can both raise awareness of deforestation <coughs> and help the governments that are trying to uh, reach the, the IEG target. A second example that gives me a lot of hope is the one country that holds about 25% of all terrestrial biodiversity, and that's Brazil. In the Brazilian Amazon, in the last five years, through a number of policies and measures, through much stricter controls, through a dedicated satellite that monitors deforestation, the government has managed to bring down the deforestation rate by about 70%. Now, Brazil is a country that has invested a lot of resources in slowing down deforestation. And not every developing country can do the same, but Brazil is now starting to help other developing countries with that technology that, by the way, is also behind our global forest watch that we're planning to launch um, early next year, and help other developing countries to achieve the same results. The third example I want to draw your attention to is a small country in Asia, and I'll let you guess which country it is. I'll tell you a little bit about it. It is a country that has um, a very interesting approach to measuring the well-being of its uh, population. It's called the Gross National Happiness Index. That's right, it's Bhutan. And in the constitution of Bhutan, in Article 5, it is stated that the forest cover may never drop below 60%. So the country as a whole has recognized the importance of forests and has made that a key part in its constitution. The same just happened in Kenya where a new constitution um, is uh, under preparation and Kenya aims to increase its forest cover from 2% to 10%. So more and more countries are recognizing the important role of forests and are making it a high-level priority to save them. There are many other countries that I could mention where encouraging progress is underway, but I think it's more important in this audience that we focus on what we can do more. I'd just like to have um, this quote at the end that saving civilization is not a spectator sport. All of us can do something, and it might not always be what we think we can do because I like working for the United Nations it's a great place where you meet a lot of people who want to change the world but I have to say that for every 99 people I meet who want to change the world I only meet one who wants to change himself or herself because that's much harder and that is at the same time what is needed we have to work on ourselves on our sustainable consumption and production, on our um, contributions we can make in our immediate surroundings. And this is, I believe, a thought I would like to leave you and all of us with, that we are part of the system, and by wanting to change it, we also have to change ourselves, we have to contribute to the political processes that are ongoing. And a final thought, forests, as I have often been referred to as the lungs of the world, because of their role for producing oxygen, but I think it is actually more accurate to refer to forests as the hearts of the world. If you look at this rainfall pattern simulation of tropical rainfall, you'll see that about every 
day or every two days, this runs through the course of a year, rain falls in the Amazon and in the Congo Basin, and the clouds that are produced here, they feed not only those regions, but they go way beyond. So the Earth literally has beating hearts. And while it's important to measure in economic terms what forests are worth, the thought I'd like to leave you with is, what is it worth to have a beating heart? Thank you very much. <laughs>